Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Well, firstly, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank everybody who has gathered here tonight. Um, we have a number of guests on the stage with us, uh, and I will go through each one and introduce them. But we have uh, Luke Patterson with us, who was a, a stalwart of unionism over many years. Uh, just, just, Joining her new boss, Jim Alistair. Yeah. Uh, we also have Councillor Stephen Cooper from Newton Arch. She's here with us. Humber, Shirley, uh, And uh, a special guest, as many people in the town will know, we have Alderman Jimmy Mina here. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mina has been through an illness, as many of you will know. But despite that, he has continued to work for his community. He's been a stalwart of loyalism for for long before I was ever born, anyway. Um, so give, give him a big cheer and well done to come back. And here for you tonight, we have some stalwarts of unionism and the campaigns for freedom from the shackles of the European Union. Ben Habib is a former Brexit MEP. And over the past year, Mr. Habib has devoted himself to securing Northern Ireland's freedom from the Northern Ireland Protocol. And he has flown to Northern Ireland tonight at his own expense to speak from this platform. And that's an amazing gesture. And I would ask you all to give a massive round of applause for Dan Habib. <laughs> and we're also joined here tonight by Baron Els Kiyakoi. He is a former MP and government minister and now a member of the House of Lords. And I'm uh, and I'm proud to say that Kate is one of my closest friends in politics, but above all else, uh, she is the best friend that the grassroots unionist and loyalist community ever had in Parliament. Uh, and I, I, I say this. 
from the bottom of my heart, and I hope everybody agrees with me, when others turn their backs or close their eyes to injustice to the unionist and loyalist community, Kate Hoy stood firm, no matter the political cost. And thank you for that, Kate, for the unionist and loyalist community. Of course, finally, to the speakers, we're joined by the TUV leader, Jim Allister, QC. Uh, and I want to just say a word briefly about Jim Allister. Uh, I'm an anti-agreement unionist, and I've devoted around the last 15 years of my life to its cause. And it's often been a very lonely, though. Anti-agreement unionism wasn't always as fashionable as it is now. I sometimes smile remembering all those who mocked and delighted our cause who have now become converts. And for a long time our cause was a very small minority within unionism and oh how times have changed. I still never forget how Mr Peter Robinson rushed past Jim Allister during a press conference at Stormont, sneering at Mr Allister as if he was a dinosaur who should be preserved only in a glass cage. Jim Allister kept the torch of traditional unionism alive almost single-handedly for decades. Yeah. And, and, and whatever about those who have tried our best to do likewise in more recent times, the ideological father of anti-agreement unionism is, and always will be, Jim Allister. Yeah. And now I want you to pay close attention to this because as I begin my remarks, I want to welcome a very special guest to the stage, a courageous lady who suffered at the hands of the divisional IRA, who suffered at the hands of the type of Republican bombs that Leo Varadkar sought to raise a threat off for political leverage. Michelle Williamson lost her parents in the Shankill bomb, and she stands with us tonight in solidarity not just as a proud member of our community who has suffered too much for our country to be robbed of us, but as a person who has been, along with every other victim of the IRA, expected to endure the apparent sacrifices necessary in pursuit of peace, but who have instead been re-traumatized again and again over the last 23 years as part of this one-sided, wicked so-called peace process which has legitimized the very people who were responsible and continue to justify not only the Shankill bombing, but Anna Skellen, Le Mans, Kingsmill, Taban, and many, many more. And it was the threat of those unspeakable acts of terrorism that was weaponized by the Irish government in seeking to have this unjust, unlawful, and unconstitutional protocol imposed upon us, binding us in chains to the Irish Republic within an economic United Ireland. And if anyone is searching deep within themselves tonight and wondering whether they genuinely feel the need to stand against this economic United Ireland, then look up at this stage tonight and look into the eyes of Michelle Williamson. That should be enough to ignite the spirit that burns deep within every Ulster man and woman. And when the question is then posed, oh, will you stand? Oh, will you stand? then the answer will be clear. Ulster men and Ulster women will always stand. Yeah. And it was Boris Johnson himself who said that no British Prime Minister could ever commit a border in the Irish Sea, yet it is our own government who have empowered the trespassers, those who have uninvited barged into Northern Ireland, our home. They have plundered our most precious belongings, the Union, and purport to subjugate us within the confines of our own house, Northern Ireland. We apparently have no right to ask them to leave, and indeed the mere suggestion that we would defend our home from these trespassers leads us to somehow being presented as the aggressors. Northern Ireland is our home, and it is that we must defend against those who would seek to colonize us within the European Union leaving us subjugated and stranded within an economic United Ireland. Bound in chains by laws we had no democratic say in being made and which we have no democratic right to overturn. Our cause will be judged by a foreign court with foreign judges. That is not freedom and that is not what generations of Ulster men fought and died for.
So I say this to the British government. We will not sit idly by, meekly cowing within the confines of our own home as trespassers and plunderers, even those empowered by our own government seek to take from us our most precious possession. The Union is more than the last lowering of the Union flag from Hillsborough Castle. It is the substance and the fundamental planks which make up the Union. It is the act of Union which our own government now purport to say they have repealed. And that forces us, ladies and gentlemen, to confront a fundamental question. Does the apparent protections within the Belfast Agreement for the constitutional status of Northern Ireland detect the substance of the Union and the Union or merely the symbol symbolism? Because if powers to make laws over Northern Ireland can be handed to a foreign power without our consent, and if the very foundational stone of the Union, the act of Union, can be repealed, then what, ladies and gentlemen, would stop joint authority, or worse, full authority over this country being handed over to Dublin? And there's another issue we have to confront. For all the lectures about the Belfast Agreement from nationalism and its, empower, its apparent sacred nature, when the chance came for nationalism to put their foot on the neck of the Unionist people by acting in collusion with those disgraceful fifth columnists in the Alliance Party, they overlaid the principle of cross-community consent. They happily did so. And ladies and gentlemen, take this as a lesson tonight for anybody who is foolish enough to believe that nationalism wants equality. They do not. Their mantra is, and always has been, a stepping stone to the actual objective, which is supremacy and taking everything that we cherish in this country for us, and we will not have it. So, they can call it a New Ireland, they can call it a shared Ireland, or they can call it whatever the other fancy name they want to come up with. The message will always be the same. A 30-year terrorist campaign from the IRA couldn't drive us from the United Kingdom. So it doesn't matter whether they use political means for the practical use of democracy, or they use threats like rules talked up by the Irish government. They will never, never have their way in Ulster. As we come to a close of this, and to those who point to the Withdrawal Act, that betrayal act which spawned an economic United Ireland, we respect our cherished principle of parliamentary sovereignty, but our fundamental British identity means more to us than any constitutional principle. And that should come as no surprise, because Parliament sought to subjugate Ulster in 1912, and so Edward Carson raised an army. So if it is the choice, between respecting the will of Parliament or our Union, then there's only ever going to be one winner. The words of the Ulster Covenant, each and every one of them, are true today as they were then. True in these days when many will change for profit or in dread. True to the same old sacred cause for which our fathers bled. And there's a man here tonight who phoned me during the week, a successful businessman and a pillar of the community, and I won't name him or embarrass him. But I was surprised to hear his anger and his commitment to be here tonight because, as he said, something had to be done. And he then said something that made me immensely proud of what this growing peaceful protest movement is achieving. He said, and I quote, Neither I nor my family have ever put out a flag in our lives, but this year we will be flying the Union flag. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, young and old, standing shoulder to shoulder here tonight, fly the Union flag proudly, but moreover, do all that you can to play your part in defending your country. And many, many years from now, one day the question will be asked of every mother, father, daughter, sibling and son. When Ulster was in peril, when the trespassers were banging on the door of our home, did you stand or did you fall? And if we all stand together, we forever shall be free. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Baroness Kate Hoy.
turnout. What wonderful weather. It's obvious. Um, sorry, can we get this thing right? Can I hear that? That's better. I'm saying wonderful to be here, and it's great to have so many people. And I'm really, really proud that I've been able to be here and join uh, Jamie. And can I say to Jamie, what is so good? I've seen so many other younger people in the audience to see so many young people carrying on the tradition of making sure that we defend the union. And I want to thank Jamie for his speech tonight. It's also great to be joined by Ben and by Jim on this stage tonight. And all of you who've come along to show that our anger at the protocol. But we're also sending a message tonight, a very strong message to the, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis, to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, to the Irish government, and to the European Union. And that message is, we will, we will not ever allow our country to be divided by, in this way, by a protocol that is actually taking away our British identity. <laughs> By five, five years ago, uh, next week, the country voted to leave the European Union in the referendum. Now the question on my ballot paper, and I think the question on all your ballot papers, was very simple. Do you want the UK to leave the European Union? It didn't say, do you want a bit of the European Union to stay part of the EU, uh, um, part of the UK? Uh, do you want little bits to leave and little bits to stay? It was very clear. It was the United Kingdom was going to leave the European Union. And that's what the people of the United Kingdom voted for. And for those in the media who continually say, oh, well, protocol, it's all about Brexit. I would say we did not get Brexit in Northern Ireland. And if we didn't get Brexit, the protocol can't be the result of Brexit either. It is the result of the efforts to thwart Brexit and using Northern Ireland as the weapon to do that. Indeed, from the minute we voted to leave, there were those inside the establishment, the media, Westminster Parliament, who set out to stop that democratic vote. They all rallied round to get another referendum. And my own party, the Labour Party, did its best, along with the Remain Tories, to slow down and thwart the result. The Irish government blatantly set out to use Northern Ireland as a weapon. And I'm afraid their whining and dining that goes on in Brussels paid off. The EU wanted to punish the United Kingdom for daring to leave their club and cynically used the issue of the trade border and the Belfast Agreement as the weapon. How dare the Irish government say, and the EU, say they care about the people of Northern Ireland. And we saw how much the EU cared when they literally overnight were going to invoke Article 16 to stop vaccinations coming into Northern Ireland. Unbelievable. And we saw the shameful act of the ex-T-Shock Varadka, who took that picture of a burnt customs post, a blown up customs post, took it to the European Union and said, should there be any trade border, anything at all at the frontier between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, there would be violence. There was the threat of violence. Do we really want to live in a country where the threat of violence means that, that those who give that threat get their way? No. <laughs> and, 
So I, I would just say what a sham the pretense about caring for, for peace in Northern Ireland has been shown to be. Now the protocol breaks the Belfast Agreement, the consent principle has been shattered and the east-west dimension of the agreement has been broken. But beyond the issues of identity and the constitution, the protocol also impacts on all of us, both as business people and consumers and ordinary members of the public. A nationalist pet owner is as disadvantaged along with their unionist neighbour. And you know, we face a very, very serious situation now in our wee country. We have seen time after time our politicians from some of the political parties literally roll over. We need our politicians to unite to save the union. And if they can't do it, we are showing here, and the movement that has organized these, these parades are showing it, that we can get that unity. If the politicians won't do it, then we have to do it for them and show them the way. I would just like to say that there are many still in the Westminster Parliament who now have seen how damaging the protocol is to the union. And we do have friends there still. And I just want to pay tribute again to Ben Habib, who has been an amazing, amazing support throughout the last year. But we do have some friends in, in, the, in, in the UK Parliament in, in Westminster. We do not have friends in the Irish government. So I see no reason, no reason at all, for any of our elected politicians at Stormont to attend North South meetings when East West has been so <laughs> We did not consent to the protocol, so why should we consent to implementing it? No one should be told to check lorries at Larn and Belfast. No one should be told to check anywhere in Northern Ireland, apart from what has always happened with some animal welfare issues coming in. If the internal market of the European Union is so important to them, then they should do the checking in their territory in the Irish Republic. they care more about their internal market or about the peace agreement. We cannot, as the Ray Jamie has said, we cannot be told by a foreign institution what to do and to make our rules. And we cannot abide by the rulings of a foreign EU court. We need peaceful resistance. This is what tonight is about, peacefully standing up for what we believe in. We must start and it must be implemented by see those who see themselves as unionists in Stormont. Now I can understand the Republican Party and I can understand the Nationalist SDLP for wanting to make the protocol the issue that helps to further their political aims. What I cannot understand is why the Alliance Party, the party that was meant to be even-handed why the alliance party want to rigorously rigorously implement the protocol and i would say that there they have shown to be what they believe they have said to be false when it comes to the crunch when it comes to the crunch the alliance party will always support those who want to destroy the union <laughs> means whatever you think about the politicians and the politics of Northern Ireland, make sure you are on the register to vote. Make sure when it comes to elections, whatever you think of people or individuals, make sure you vote. Abstentions does not serve the interests of the union. And one other thing, all over England, Scotland and Wales, we have families, relatives, friends, all of whom have their own members of parliament that 
they vote for or don't vote for. So we should be lobbying them. The diaspora of Northern Ireland is huge in Great Britain. They need to be getting on to their MPs and telling them exactly what the protocol has meant for their friends and relatives here in Northern Ireland. And that can be done by all of us. We all, we all have some, some contribution to make. We all can do something, even if it's just speaking to your neighbour, as, as, as has already been said. Over the last 30 years, I was an MP in London. I always kept an interest in Northern Ireland. I always kept involved in some way. And now that I'm back home here in Northern Ireland full time and going over now and again to London, I am prepared to do my bit to absolutely make sure that we win this battle and get rid of the protocol. <laughs> We all reflect on the past hundred years of Northern Ireland. We all reflect on those many lives lost and those people who battled so hard to maintain peace and stability in Northern Ireland. And we remember those who tried to destroy our country by bombing and by terrorizing. Those people we remember now and we owe it to them to make sure that it's not going to be a conservative and unionist government that destroys the union when we stood up for so long against the terrorists. So my message tonight to all of you, be confident, be proud, be active, save the union, stop the protocol, ditch the Boris border in the Irish Sea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next up, we want to... Yes, sorry, you're just saying there, so the people, some of the people at the back can't hear very well, so if the crowd could come forward a wee bit, so the ones at the back can hear better. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to have Ben Habib, and then we have a very special treat. We're going to finish with the one and only Jim Allister to, to end us off. So, but ladies and gentlemen... Please give a very, very warm welcome to Mr. Ben Habib. Well, thank you very much, Jamie, and thank you everyone for welcoming me, almost really an interloper, so warmly into your bosom, into Northern Ireland. Now, I'm not really a politician. Actually, I'm a humble businessman. But I got so fed up with Theresa May and all her shenanigans that I was, I sort of was forced out of um, a passive viewer, a passive viewing mode into active politics. And it was for democracy that I stood up when I joined Nigel Farage's Brexit party. It was to make sure that the vote in 2016 was upheld. And it's for democracy that I'm standing up for the northern, standing up against the Northern Ireland Protocol because it is inherently undemocratic and illegal. Yeah. Now there was a report produced in November 2017. Forgive me for being a little technical and dull for a moment. There was a report produced in November 2017 which said, and this won't surprise any of you, that actually having a light touch customs border on the island of Ireland was no problem. That the trade that crossed that border was less than 5 billion euros a year, less than 1% of the trade of, between the United Kingdom and the EU. That you could have trusted trader status, that you could have number plate recognition, that there was no need for any infrastructure at the border. None of this is a surprise. There was no need for the narrative of a hard border on the island of Ireland. But what will surprise you is that that report was produced by the European Union. Now, whoever produced that report either wasn't speaking to his political bosses or was behind what they were trying to achieve. Because very shortly after that, 
Leo Varadkar, together with the European Union, alighted on this brilliant plan to weaponize the border, to use it against the British government in the negotiations over Brexit. And that's what I thought it was to begin with, just an attempt to get negotiating advantage. But it's much worse than that, ladies and gentlemen. I've come to realize that it is not sufficient for them to have economic advantage over the United Kingdom. It's not sufficient for them that we suffer. What they seek is a dismemberment of the United Kingdom. And that's what the protocol does. And make no mistake, if Northern Ireland falls, Scotland will fall as well. The real villains in this story, the real villains are the EU and the Irish government, because they have falsified and misrepresented entirely what a customs border on the island of Ireland would be. But I'm afraid that those to whom you have given your allegiance, the Westminster government, they are the ones who have really forsaken you because they should have stood up to that false narrative. Yes. Did we not all cheer when we heard Boris Johnson at the DUP conference say that they could, it was unconscionable for there to be a border in the Irish Sea? Did we not cheer when he was prime minister at his first G7 summit in Beerix and he said the withdrawal agreement is dead, dead, dead? But at the time he said that, Michael Gove was busy resuscitating the withdrawal agreement. Did we not share when we read page five of the Tory party manifesto? And it said, the United Kingdom will lead the EU as one United Kingdom. Yeah. He said, we would take back control of our laws, our borders, our cash, and our fishing. We have control of none of those as long as the protocol subsists. And he sold the fishing industry down the drain. And it is not as if Boris Johnson doesn't know what he's doing. On the 12th of September last year, he wrote in the Telegraph that it was necessary to break international law in a limited and specific manner because the protocol presented an existential threat to the fabric of the United Kingdom. So he was going to bring forward clauses in the internal market bill that would neuter the protocol. But as fast as he made that undertaking, he gave up on it. And the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that Westminster does not see Brexit as something it doesn't truly see Brexit as, as of sovereign importance. It puts trade and pragmatism, as it sees it, ahead of the integrity of the Union of the United Kingdom. We even had counsel for government stand up in court and say, this may surprise some of you, counsel for government stand up in court and say that the Act of Union 1800 that brought Great Britain and, North and Ireland together had been repealed. Are you aware that the Act of Union has been repealed? So, we are where we are, and it's a horrific situation. But there is a hero in this otherwise horrific story. And the hero in this story are the people of Northern Ireland. It's you. This protocol is not going to be defeated in Westminster. This protocol is not going to be defeated in the court in Belfast or the Supreme Court. This protocol will only be, de be defeated if you continue to make yourselves heard. You have to stand up for Northern Ireland. There is no solution to the protocol through the protocol. As Kate so brilliantly put, the Boris border needs to be ditched 
the protocol needs to be ditched. Thank you very much, everyone. And finally, finally, ladies and gentlemen, I want those despicable enemies in Dublin to hear us as you welcome Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you in Newton Ards tonight. Yeah. Newton Ards is where I went to school. Yeah. So it has a place in my heart. And it is a great joy to be back and to share this platform and to follow in speaking after our adopted Osterman, Ben Habib. <laughs> ben has done more for this cause than many elected politicians in this province. Yeah. And we all owe him a considerable debt in that regard. So thank you, Ben, for all you have done. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we are all gathered here tonight to exercise our right of peaceful protest. And we have much to protest about. Yeah. Yeah. Because as we gather here, as unionists, the union that we believe in is being dismantled before our very eyes by the wicked protocol. Yeah. We all need to understand how it works. It is designed to partition the United Kingdom to exclude Northern Ireland to annex us into the EU with the consequence of preparing us for what they see as the ultimate outcome of Irish unity. The design of the protocol is to create an all-Ireland economic unit in the belief that if they can do that, then it is a relatively short step from economic unity to political unity. That is the evil intent of the protocol. And how does it propose to do it? Well, by taking Northern Ireland and putting it in a foreign single market for goods by making it subject to a foreign customs code and a foreign VAT regime and making all the laws that govern that, which is a huge part of our economy, make all those laws made not in Belfast, not in London, but in Brussels. And therein, is the first transfer of sovereignty. When you are in a situation, in a democracy, where you're not governed by those you elect making the laws that control your lives, but you're governed by foreign jurisdiction where you have no say, no input, no control over the laws that govern much of our economy and that is what the protocol does that ladies and gentlemen is constitutional change it is already happening and it's happening without any consent and that is why we are wholly justified in being angry in being 
outraged, uh, but above all, being determined to unstitch it. So how do we do that? How do we disrupt and unstitch the protocol? Well, let me tell you how you don't do it. You don't do it by implementing it. And one of the most shameful things, utterly shameful things, is that a DUP minister has built the border posts, the push, the puts posts. I'm not satisfied with that. Day and daily, his staff implement the protocol, checking the goods partitioning the United Kingdom, determining that you cannot have free trade within your own country. And as Peter Robinson said a couple of months ago, but he was right about this, you cannot say you're against the protocol while at the same time implementing it. And what message, what message does it send to London and to Brussels if a unionist minister is doing their dirty work and implementing the protocol? It conveys the message that we're not really serious, that we're just bluffing and blustering. And that is one of the biggest threats to the, to the union that it is being implemented by ourselves. Shame on those who are implementing the protocol. But I tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, if this protocol takes root, this union is over. Make no mistake about it. The protocol is designed to end the union between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, to prepare us for the final handover to the Irish Republic, to cause, to cause our economy to look away from London, to look to Dublin, to cause us to be dependent on trade, on commerce, on an all island basis, rather than on a United Kingdom basis, to build all of that infrastructure so that we get to the point where there is an all Ireland economically. And as I've already said, they then believe a political all Ireland is a natural follow through. That is the wicked intent of the protocol. That is why if, the pro if we do not kill the protocol, their protocol will kill the union. Yeah. Of course, there's much more besides for you to protest about. And you saw some of it yesterday. Yesterday was a day of shame and humiliation. What we witnessed in Stormont yesterday was a victory for ransom politics yet again. A victory for an insatiable Sinn Féin. A victory for those who said, unless we get our way over Irish language, then there'll be no Stormont. And it was cringing. It was humiliating to watch Edwin Putz come into the chamber along with his poodle <laughs> and nominate the poodle to be First Minister. <laughs> at the behest, at the, at the behest of Sinn Féin. And he cared more about doing the bidding of Sinn Féin 
that he did about doing the bidding of his own party who told him not to do it. And so he is deservedly gone. But the damage he did lives on. The damage he did was to demonstrate to the British government that they have his measure, they have the measure of his party. The British government had a choice. Are we going to please Sinn Féin or are we going to please the DUP? And they chose to please IRA Sinn Féin. Why? Because they had the measure of the DUP. And it was that spineless, hopeless, pathetic, useless attitude that enabled them to do it. So what, what, ladies and gentlemen, what, ladies and gentlemen, do we now need to do? What needs to be done in Stormont is the new DUP leader needs to find a backbone. He needs a backdoor. And he needs to resign the first minister. Yes. And he needs to say to the British prime minister, prime minister, there will be no first minister so long as there is a protocol. Yes. He needs to bring it to the point where the Prime Minister has a choice to make. Does he want to save the protocol or does he want to save the Stormont institution? And unless or until by determined political action, we bring the matter to a head in that way. And that also includes no more North Southery. Yeah. Yeah. Why should we be the why should we be the fools of watching the East-West relationship trashed and yet as if nothing had happened, go on working the North South limb of the Belfast Agreement? It's a time to find backbone. It's a time to stand up, because if we do not, the time will pass to stand up. That's the reality. So the new DUP leader needs, the onus is on them. They're the biggest party. They need to withdraw the first minister. They need to create a, a standoff where the prime minister has to choose. Do I want the Belfast institutions or do I want the protocol. That is the way politically we bring this matter to a head. And that will also test some unionists. Does the chauffeur driven car matter more than their country? Yeah. Does the big ministerial salary matter more than getting rid of the protocol? It is people like you, unionist electors, who put them there. And tonight, we're calling them to account. Yeah. If we know what needs to be done, if we understand what the protocol is doing to us, then they need to step up to the plate. And if they don't, they're not just betraying their country, but the people of this country. And when the day of reckoning comes, then remember this, you get what you vote for. And let's be very clear, this storment is not worth saving. This system of government is not worth saving because this system of government 
will never work. Why is that? Because you can only have a government if at its top and heart you have a party that doesn't want the country to work, doesn't want the country to even exist. So when you create a system which is dependent on having a government and having at its top and its heart Sinn Féin, who can't even say the name of the country, then no one should be surprised. No one should be surprised that they take every opportunity to destabilize, to make sure the country doesn't work. And it is only a fool who would go on saying, oh, if we just give them a little more, if we package it in a few Irish language uh, uh, words, then maybe they would make Northern Ireland work. What, are they having a laugh? I tell you who's having a laugh. Sinn Féin is having a laugh. And how they must laugh, not just up their, not just up their sleeve, but in the face of unionism, when they tow their line, when they fall into line with their demands, when they pay the ransom. And that's the shameful thing we saw yesterday. The ransom being paid to IRA Sinn Féin by the DUP. But it's from the grassroots that change will come. It's from the grassroots who do, uh, that those who are presently doing what they shouldn't be doing, implementing the protocol, will be forced either to take a stand or out of office. Frankly, I don't mind which it is, but I know this. The imperative is that if we do not bring down this protocol, then the day will come when everyone will see that it was the protocol that was the vehicle that delivered us out of the union, as is its intent. If we have a united determination that we are not going to allow that to happen. Now, by being here tonight, by protesting as you do with just cause, peacefully, authentically, you are playing a very big part in driving home the message. <laughs> driving home the message that Ulster is not for sale. I hope... Boris Johnson needs to hear it. Dublin politicians need to hear it. Brussels politicians need to hear it. But maybe first and foremost, Stormont politicians need to hear it. As we come to the close of the platform speeches, I want to uh, pay tribute to all the persons who have spoken here tonight. I think they've been absolutely fantastic and articulated the message well. But I see however many number of people here tonight, a vast, vast number of people. And I think people want to the message to be heard. And if you disagree with me, maybe, but I think you will all agree with me that for 23 years, our community has been expected to give and give and give. We have been expected the destruction of the RUC, the criminalization of our veterans, the hounding and the dehumanization of loyalism. We cannot celebrate our culture, we cannot have our band played and everything about us we have to give and give and give and this, this, this process, this process fundamentally predicated upon this fundamental issue that unionism must give and nationalism must get and I want to send a clear message and I hope you all agree with me, enough is enough! <laughs> Just in case 
Dublin aren't listening or anybody else aren't listening. And in case anybody thought I was joking during the week as to where these peaceful protests could, could go next, if you're going to stand with us and if you agree, here is a message to Dublin. If you don't listen, we will come to Dublin in our thousands. <laughs> And if Dublin wish to partition our country and wish to create instability because the protocol creates instability because it can never be, it can never coexist with stability. And if they want to create instability in Ulster, then by God, we can create instability in Dublin. <laughs> so finally, ladies and gentlemen, the band captains has asked me to ask the bands all to form up in the square. We're going to walk as one community, as one people, down South Street. And we're going to finish off with the national anthem at the office of those despicable traitors in the Alliance Party. So ladies and gentlemen, if everybody can form up and we will all walk together, shoulder to shoulder. Thank you.